Michael Trent Reznor, born May the 17th, 1965 in Pennsylvania, is the sole focus of Nine Inch Nails. While some early press photos would have you believe this was a full band, in reality, Reznor was the brainchild of this sonically destructive force from the beginning. Debut record Pretty Hate Machine, released in 1989, was written, performed and recorded in full by Reznor. When it came to touring, he would simply hire musicians to interpret his music live on stage. Synth music was huge in the 80s and dominated the airwaves with artists such as the Eurythmics, the Human League, and New Order, releasing some of the most memorable music of the time. In fact, it was almost impossible to turn on the radio in the 80s and not hear a band incorporating some sort of synth technology into their music. And of course, the undisputed synth kings of pop, Depeche Mode, had already carved out a name for themselves around this time. However, this romanticized version of synth music was just that. It had an air of loving mystery to it. It was mostly upbeat, happy and uplifting music for the everyday teenager to bop along to at a high school disco, or for young adults to enjoy a night out at a local discotheque. Trent Reznor wanted to tap in to the darker side of synth. Nine Inch Nails would be classed as industrial music, a genre that employs mechanical sounds and patterns to convey a more aggressive tone, harsh and often abrasive. It said that the term industrial was derived from a record label called Industrial Records, a label formed by an English band called Throbbing Gristle in 1976. <laughs> Throbbing Gristle are also noted as one of the first industrial bands that paved the way for other artists to follow suit. Trent Reznor has certainly had an interesting career with some very surprising twists and turns. Not only did he have a hand in producing Marilyn Manson's first record, Portrait of an American Family, released in 1994, he would also come to collaborate with the enigmatic icon David Bowie on his 1997 single, I'm Afraid of Americans. I'm afraid of Americans. As well as scoring music for several films over the years, Ministry, Skinny Puppy and KMFDM would become some of the prominent names within the industrial genre and would all tap into the darker aspect of synth music, but none more so than that of Trent Reznor's powerful creation. This is Pretty Hate Machine, the story of Nine Inch Nails. Music's always been a way for me to try to feel better and get better, and, but I think, the, I think the inspiration is coming from a less destructive place than it used to be. You know, my life really just kind of crashed and burned. I, got, uh, I had to come to terms with being an addict, you know, which was something that I would for a long time lied to myself about the status of, until it really was, I couldn't lie anymore because I was either going to die or I had to get better. Trent Reznor was raised in rural Pennsylvania and started playing piano from an early age. In an interview with Synth History magazine, he says, I was kind of trained to be a piano player and was being urged to be a classical pianist and drop out of school and study with a nun at about age 12. As a preteen, music seemed to be a big part of his life and like many youngsters, he was exposed to Kiss, which like a lot of kids, helped him to develop a daydream of becoming a rock star one day, or at least being in a band. Trent's father bought him a Wurlitzer electric piano with an MXR Phase 100 pedal and he proceeded to start playing around with friends in some basement bands, as he calls them. Trent could also play the tenor sax and tuba. He was a member of his school's jazz and marching bands whilst also appearing in school productions of Jesus Christ Superstar and The Music Man. 
During this time, Trent would be raised by his maternal grandparents as his father and mother divorced at the age of six. It would be his grandfather who bought him his first synthesizer when Trent was a teenager. It was a Moog prodigy, Moog being a very popular manufacturer of synths at the time. This seemed to be the start of his obsession with electrical musical equipment, and he even landed a job working at a keyboard store in Cleveland just so he could get discounts on them. Reznor wanted to escape the small-town USA environment that he felt may have been holding him back from experiencing the world, so when he saw a band like KISS, this was his way out. I always liked larger-than-life superhuman rock stars, but I never thought I was that. When Nine Inch Nails came out, it was a very anti-image thing. I just wanted to be part of a rock band that was very violent and passionate. One of Trent's early musical pursuits came about when he was studying music and computer engineering at Algony College. He joined a group called Option 30, where he offered up his vocal and keyboard talents but would quickly part ways with this outfit after dropping out of school to follow his musical career on a full-time basis. There's very little information on Option 30. We do know they were formed in 1982 and Reznor is thought to have been with the band up until 1984 but had little input when it came to actual songwriting, which would explain why he left in order to create his own musical vision. Early live footage of the band shows Option 30 to be very reminiscent of the casual electro rock pop that was very popular at the time. Whilst Option 30 definitely didn't represent Trent Reznor's sonic ambitions, you could already see his ambiguous stage performance coming through at an early age. After dropping out of college, Trent would join a covers band called The Urge before becoming keyboard player for The Innocent after a very brief stint with this band, only releasing one single with them in 1985 called Living in the Street. He then joined another synth pop group called Exotic Birds, who appeared in a film called Light of Day, where they played a fictional band named The Problems. It seemed as if Reznor was struggling to find a group of musicians that he could really connect with. Looking back in hindsight, it's easy to see why. All of these groups wanted to follow the happy-go-lucky synth-pop new wave ambience that had become so saturated in pop culture. Not only this, Reznor felt like somewhat of an outcast. He said, no one in my family has ever finished school. I thought, okay, in high school I was a loser and I didn't fit in. So I thought in college I'm going to make some friends and try and fit in. But I was banished instantly. I felt like a misfit. At some point during these frivolous encounters with local pop bands in the mid 80s, Reznor managed to get a job working as a handyman and assistant engineer in a recording studio called The Right Track in Cleveland. This is where Trent would give birth to his first batch of Nine Inch Nails demos that would come to be collectively known as Purest Feeling. On days where the studio was closed, the owner would allow Trent to use the studio for free. Trent seemed destined to be on the fringe of the popular synthwave movement from the beginning. I heard stuff other people were recording and I always thought this stuff sucks. I thought I could do better, but for a long time I wasn't doing anything about it. I was arranging other people's music. I was playing keyboards on other people's demos. I was playing live, taking drugs and being an idiot. Fooling myself that I was doing something when really I wasn't. Then when I got in the studio, I realized that there's an opportunity here. I could make it happen. I had this romantic notion that Prince did it himself and I fully respected him for that. So I just started to do it. I was intimidated by guitars because I always liked them but couldn't play them for shit. Trent had finally decided to take matters into his own hands and give birth to what would become Nine Inch Nails. Um, what's your question? Um, where did you guys get your name, Nine Inch Nails? Now there had to have been something more creative than that, <laughs> but that's okay, it's okay, it's, you're welcome to ask. No, not to be rude, people have been asking me that for... We've been around, what, three years or so. No, no great significance, just thought of it, liked it two weeks later. 
that's a test for a band name. You write it down, you like it that day, if you wake up the next day and it's, and it's okay, then it's a good name. And that worked, and it was better than Toad the Wet Sprocket, so... <laughs> October the 20th, 1989, would see Pretty Hate Machine hit the shelves. This was the debut record that Trent had worked so hard on over the past year or so. Whilst he was generally influenced by 80s music, one album in particular was a key turning point for him. Pink Floyd's The Wall, released in 1979, was somewhat of an obsession for Reznor. He said he listened to this album countless times when he was younger, so it was a major factor that would determine the direction of Pretty Hate Machine. Aside from that, he simply wanted to make an album that he would enjoy listening to himself. Three singles would be released from Pretty Hate Machine. Down In It, Sin, and Head Like A Hole. Just four months later, it would enter the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number 75. It was essentially a commercial success and opened doors for Nine Inch Nails almost immediately after this. Trent's goal was to create dark and aggressive music, but from the appeal of a pop music basis, to make it more appealing to a wider audience than just the general industrial crowd. He said, I think it's just more accessible. The way I write a song is I'm approaching it as a pop song. I tried to start with some sort of melody, but then add some aggression to it. We get labeled as being industrial right, by the media. And some people that tends to irk because they're harking back to what industrial was originally coined for and those type of bands, Throbbing Gristle test department, etc., which we have very little in common with. So, that, I don't know, that seems to irritate some people. I didn't ever go around saying we're an industrial band, but... All right. Trent Reznor would put together a group of musicians to take this aggression on tour. Although the entire album had been recorded by Trent in a studio, he now thought it was best to have musicians interpret the songs live. The following year, 1990, Nine Inch Nails would play close to 100 shows, sharing the stage with a wide range of acts such as The Jesus and Mary Chain, oh, Peter Murphy of post-punk goth band Bauhaus, the golden years. and even Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids. Trent Reznor took this aggression on tour literally by regularly smashing up his equipment during and after shows. Combine that with the music videos that were now rotating on MTV and Nine Inch Nails were quickly becoming a well-known and unique name. The hype was starting to build and during the summer of 1991, Nine Inch Nails would join the lineup for the first ever Lollapalooza tour. The festival was founded by Perry Farrell, singer for Jane's Addiction, who would headline the 26 dates across America. Other artists invited to play included Susie and the Banshees, Body Count, and Butthole Surfers, amongst others. Following this tour, Reznor would waste no time in starting work on his next project for Nine Inch Nails and would surround himself in a very macabre environment. One body in a vehicle near the gate, a man and a woman in the main room, and a man and a woman on the lawn in front of the house. Reznor decided to move into a property situated in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles. The house at 150 Cielo Drive became the focal point of global news headlines in 1969, where members of the Charles Manson family brutally murdered several people, including then American actress and model Sharon Tate. Reznor set up a studio here to record the Broken EP released in 1992 and the second Nine Inch Nails album, The Downward Spiral, which many fans consider to be Trent's masterpiece. Whilst this may have seemed like a good idea for Reznor at the time, it would eventually make him question many aspects of his creative process and fascination with the outside world. Because I was aware of the way I wanted Nine Inch Nails to be presented, you know, and I wanted to have some sort of um, 
kind of an artistic feel to it. Not as it's not product. It's a piece of art. I look at my music as art, and I wanted it promoted that way, and I wanted to be in control of that. During his time at the Manson murder house, Sharon Tate's sister would confront Reznor in a one-off chance encounter. She asked him, "Are you exploiting my sister's death by living in her house?" It seemed Trent was already struggling with the idea that people had been murdered in the house he was living in, as eventually he left in December of 1993, stating, There was too much history in that house for me to handle. I guess it never really struck me before, but it did then. She lost her sister from a senseless, ignorant situation that I don't want to support. When she was talking to me, I realized for the first time, what if it was my sister? I went home and cried that night. It made me see there's another side to things. The interesting twist to this story is that Trent Reznor claimed in an interview some years later that he had no idea that it was the infamous Manson house until the day he moved in, which honestly seems hard to believe given he told Tate's sister that he moved into the property due to his fascination with American folklore at the time. I was looking for a house to put a studio in temporarily to record a record instead of going to a real studio. And I was going to do it in New Orleans where I was living, but couldn't find a place that met all the requirements of big enough, not next to neighbors so you can make noise. Came out to LA for a day and saw like 10 houses in a row, and that was one of them. And at the end of the day, we just decided that was pretty much the coolest one. We didn't know at the time that was it, because um, the address is different than yeah. in the book. And someone mentioned, hey, I think that, you know, that Sharon Tate house is right up around there somewhere. And they happened to have a copy of Elder Skelter and started looking through it and saw this picture of the ladder that I was standing on that day. I was like, oh, oh man. So then I was like, oh, you got to run it now. You got to do it, you know? So this lat the only time we'd seen it after that was um, when we drove out knowing that it was it and get there at night. Reznor also had a Nine Inch Nails video filmed in the house for the single Gave Up, released in 1992. Either way, the house seemed to have a profound impact on Trent Reznor and his music. Not only would Nine Inch Nails gain some notoriety during the early years, Reznor would also ignite two very interesting professional and personal relationships with Marilyn Manson and David Bowie. It's thought that Manson and Trent first met in 1989 and became close friends. So much so that Reznor ended up becoming somewhat of a mentor to Marilyn Manson, helping produce some of his early work and even signing him to his own record label, Nothing Records. Founded by Reznor and John Malm in 1992, Trent's manager at the time. The good thing is that Trent, uh, being an artist, you know, respects the artist's point of view. So it's... Uh... He happens to be the only person in the music industry that I trust, and um, they gave us the opportunity to put out our record completely raw and unexpurgated, and we didn't have to censor ourselves, and that was the most important thing because it's not worth it for me to do this unless we do it the way that I want to do it. You can even see Marilyn Manson singing and playing guitar in the Nine Inch Nails video Gave Up, filmed in Sharon Tate's house. Although recently, Trent Reznor has publicly distanced himself from the self-proclaimed god of fuck, Manson, he played a vital role in his early success. Reznor would help to produce Marilyn Manson's debut record, Portrait of an American Family, released in 1994, the widely successful follow-up EP, Smells Like Children, and also worked on Antichrist Superstar. One of Manson's most widely revered albums, still so to this day. However, it would be Trent's collaboration with David Bowie that would become far more inspirational for him in many ways. Not only was this an opportunity for Reznor to work with a musical icon, he would also turn to Bowie for help with his substance addiction. Little did either of them know, Trent would succumb to a heroin overdose some years later, nearly ending his life. Yeah, it, was, it was scary at first, but then... I mean, hi, it's David Bowie. And I, at first I didn't think it was, but then instantly you knew that it was. And, and he mentioned his idea of doing this tour, and um, of course at that time it was only, what, three shows or a couple cities? <laughs> and uh, it got me thinking about it, and then I realized that it would be something that would be, be a challenge to do, and I think it, 
then it would be um, a challenge to present the whole show in a unique way. So it's not just the uh, opening act, headline act, but it's something that was a bit unusual that would make it make sense in a way. In 1992, Nine Inch Nails released a music video for the song Happiness in Slavery, which was quickly banned by MTV and almost every television network at the time. The inspiration for the video derived from a French novel called The Torture Garden, published in 1899. The video depicts a naked man being strapped to a mechanical machine whilst being tortured, amongst other things so it's understandable why TV stations discontinued their rotation of the video. Whilst David Bowie had previously heard the album Pretty Hate Machine, it would be the video for Happiness in Slavery, taken from the broken EP, that really caught his attention. Because I've been told like he just moved to this funeral home that he'd opened up as a recording studio and I should call him there and, and, and the usual, the apocryphal stories, the Sharon Tate house and all that, you know, and it's sort of, you quite... I, I went in with a sense of unease and no trepidations at all when I first contacted Trent and uh, his uh, management organisation about the idea of doing the tour together. I'd read quite a few interviews where my name had come up in uh, conjunction with influences that had been part of his musical makeup, and uh, I just thought, well, I, I kind of grab the bull by the horns and, and, and see if he'd want to do this tour. Yeah. This led to Bowie becoming a big fan of the Downward Spiral album released in 1994, which was ironically inspired by David Bowie's 1977 LP, Low. Yeah, I'd heard a pretty hate machine, but as uh, and, and it was just a passing interest, I'll be brutally frank. It was, uh, I think it was, uh, inadvertently, it was MTV's fault because I saw the video that you'd banned and I thought, that's really good. And what happened is that because of that, I uh, then really got into what he was doing and then Downward Spiral was really, I thought, just an exceptional album. Bowie got in touch with Trent Reznor's management to see if he would be interested in touring together, which resulted in Nine Inch Nails supporting David Bowie on his outside tour that took place from the 14th of September, 1995 to the 14th of October, 1996 with Nine Inch Nails supporting Bowie on the US leg of his tour. The unique aspect of this tour is that Bowie and Nine Inch Nails would merge their sets together to try and create something completely different, a live show that would never be seen again. This fascinating collaboration also led to Trent and Bowie working on a remix of I'm Afraid of Americans, a single originally written by Bowie and Brian Eno that appeared on Bowie's 1997 album, Earthling. I'm afraid of Americans. In the same year, Reznor would be responsible for producing the soundtrack to David Lynch's neo-noir film Lost Highway that featured music from not only Nine Inch Nails, but also David Bowie, The Smashing Pumpkins, Marilyn Manson, and even Rammstein. When the soundtrack was released as an album on February the 18th, 1997, it landed at number seven on the Billboard charts, adding yet another incredible accomplishment to the early career of Trent Reznor. The new millennium would become an emotional roller coaster ride for Trent Reznor. Despite his early success with Nine Inch Nails throughout the 90s, it appeared he'd been suffering from a long term alcohol and substance abuse issue. Trent seemed to struggle with the reality of the outside world, specifically the abundance of destruction and human apathy. He was angry at the world, maybe even angry at himself. The self-destruction button was pushed when I first started writing. There was a sense that I couldn't fit in anywhere. I couldn't relate to people. I felt alone. I felt angry about it. And part of me is still that. I felt like I was heading down into something that wasn't going to have a good ending. That ended up being addiction. Its claws were in me, but it hadn't fully revealed itself. Unfortunately for Trent, this addiction became very much a realization when he overdosed on heroin in June of 2000. 
Whilst music may have been an initial therapy for him, it was obvious that music alone wasn't enough to drown out the world around him or his own thoughts. A world that must have appeared violent, unforgiving and nihilistic. Trent also struggled to deal with becoming famous, having millions of people now looking to him for their own version of musical therapy. It distorted my personality and became overwhelming. To deal with having everyone treat you different, to going from not being able to afford a gas bill, to show up to arenas full of people who kind of think they know you. The line starts to blur between the guy on stage and the person you used to be. Although this battle with addiction almost cost Reznor his life, it also helped spawn the fourth Nine Inch Nails record, With Teeth, released in 2005, that features the now widely critically acclaimed and Grammy-nominated single, The Hand That Feeds, with the album debuting at number one on the American Billboard charts. What started out as one young man experimenting with synthesizers in his spare time evolved into one of the most recognizable and mysteriously compelling sounds of the 90s, so much so that even country legend Johnny Cash would record his own heart-wrenching rendition of the song Hurt, taken from the Downward Spiral album. Over the years, many iconic artists have left their mark on the world with groundbreaking and innovative music that would inspire generations to come. However, for many, Nine Inch Nails was quite simply the perfect drug. Music